the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab. Translating research into action. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'd like to thank everyone for, for being here this afternoon and, and making the journey across the city. Um, we're very happy to have our fifth roundtable in the Gender Evaluation and Empowerment uh, Roundtable series. And this is also the second one in Mumbai. So before we, we get started with the, with the speakers, I wanted to give a bit of a background um, on this, this roundtable series. So this is a collaboration between uh, Clear South Asia UN Women and the Community of Evaluators South Asia. So the idea for this roundtable came about um, about a year ago when, uh, when we were having a conversation amongst the three organizations, um, as well as a conversation with a lot of both individuals and organizations that were working in evaluation that had some sort of gender focus, whether it be uh, evaluating a gender specific program or trying to bring gender into evaluations across a variety of sectors. So one of the things that, that came about a lot of these conversations was that there are very few platforms in which we're able to, to come to uh, common conversations on specifically evaluating um, programs that have either have a gender specific focus or bringing gender into um, a more general sort of evaluation. So this, um, so then that's how we came about to, to have this roundtable series. Um, and we really want to have the opportunity to be able to discuss some of the, um, the fundamentals of evaluation, whether it be the data collection, the analysis, or um, in general, uh, coming to a common language on, on how we can successfully integrate gender into evaluation. So each of these, these roundtables have had um, a different focus. Um, in some cases, the focus was sectoral, so looking at specific types of programs. And in some cases, the focus was on methodology. So really focusing on, on certain types of methods. So for this, uh, this fifth roundtable in the series, we've decided to bring in a qualitative focus. So we have two, um, two experts here um, in, in qualitative methods that will be presenting a little bit about their research um, and helping us t learn a few lessons um, of some of the challenges as well as techniques in, in using qualitative methods to study gender. So our first speaker um, is Yamani Atmevales. Um, who will be speaking on um, the, her title, the title of her presentation is, is Beyond Focus Group Discussions, Using Qualitative Methods and Analysis for Gender-Focused Evaluations. Um, so Yamini Atmavilas is, program, is the Program Officer for Measurement, Learning and Evaluation uh, for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in India. So she supports the, um, the measurement, learning and evaluation work of the foundation in India. Um, particularly relating to a cluster of interventions in reproductive maternal and child health um, that involve working with government, the private sector, self-help groups of women from marginalized communities in Bihar. So uh, previously she, has, uh, she headed the gender studies and evaluation work of the Administrative Staff College of India, ASCII, um, where she led evaluations of government programs for health, adolescent girls empowerment, um, and a maternity benefits cash transfer program as well as assignments on uh, measuring gender discrimination in social institutions and developing m and &E frameworks for adolescent reproductive and sexual health rights programs. Um, so she has a PhD from Emory University and over, yeah, sorry, okay, and I'll just say this, <laughs> and over uh, 15 years of professional experience um, in work spanning civil society, academia, and consulting. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much, Urmi, and thanks for inviting me to this. Um, and sorry, not a very gender-sensitive microphone. Is it? <laughs> Actually, make sure I don't use one hand for some reason. <laughs> um, thank you very much for coming, and um, I am really thrilled to be here and to talk about something that's very close to my heart, which is um, both women's empowerment doing gender-focused uh, analyses and research and evaluations and um, um, talking uh, and presenting some of our work. Um, thank you very much to CLEAR and UN Women for putting this together. Um, so I just wanted to explain the title. So when I said beyond focus group discussions, it wasn't really to say focus group discussions are bad or that they're um, not useful. 
But for those of us who are at heart more mixed methods researchers like uh, myself, um, a lot of times when you ask someone what's your qualitative design, what's the qualitative work that, you're, that an evaluation or a research design is presenting and the standard answer you get is, well, we, we're using focus group discussions to develop our questionnaires. And so really my, I mean, uh, it's really a fatigue um, of uh, hearing that constantly and, um, and uh, you know, that focus group discussions somehow become used as shorthand for really the wealth of qualitative work that's possible and qualitative designs that we should be engaging with. And so that's really the spirit of this title. So those of us, I mean, I also use focus group discussions quite well, and I encourage you to continue using them. But really, this is to set out this, um, this sort of uh, bias almost where we don't look beyond um, focus group discussions or a couple of semi-structured interviews or key informant interviews. And we consider that sort of the summoned um, substance of qualitative work. So I just want to get some terminology right because this is something that constantly comes up uh, when we talk about gender-focused evaluation. So what is um, uh, gender-focused evaluation? And um, um, a lot of times, I mean, you can do gender analyses running, uh, you know, introducing gender as a dummy variable into your regression and you can spit out a set of analyses and you can also get very valuable information that way. But when we, call, when we talk about gender-focused evaluations, what we're really trying to um, get at is an evaluation that at its heart is trying to address or understand gender inequities. That it, it, the assumption is that there is inequality and that you're trying to understand it. Um, at the same time, it's not just about women. In some ways, I think in the 90s, when we shifted from this focus from WID to GAD, a lot of the language became um, sort of just substituting where we were thinking about women to just thinking about gender. And um, even though conceptually those, you know, those um, uh, researchers who developed these were uh, meant something quite structural and quite uh, um, much more, much deeper and layered, um, the way that it became used in international development was really just as a, as a shorthand for women again. And so really when we, if we're trying to focus on uh, an evaluation or a research question around gender, it's about asking these questions, uh, it's about conceptualizing gender as a very intersectional category where you're looking at age, you're looking at region, you're looking at caste, you're looking at religion, you're looking at nationality, you're looking at sexual orientation. So you're bringing all of these various axes of identity and that gender becomes an yet another in that mix. And so when we talk about gender, we are really talking about this mix or this intersecting, intersectional identity. The other, um, another key thing is that gender is also relational. It's also about, it's a relational category where you're trying to understand um, a particular social group, whichever one that might be, against a set of other groups. So it's not necessarily studying women among, you know, unto themselves. It's not about studying this homogenous um, category without a reference to others. It could be women, different groups of women when you're trying to probe hierarchies, but it's really about looking at that relational um, aspect of it. Then, of course, you, the assumption that this is, um, you're, you're constantly telescoping between the experiential, the individual, and the structural um, as different levels of analysis. So this is what we try to build when we talk about gender-focused evaluations. Then you have a whole host of feminist principles that have also in, uh, informed and influenced the way gender-focused evaluations are constructed, but may not always find valence when we set them up and try to do this work. So uh, several key principles, feminist principles, are also about um, on the top list, which are that looking at genders intersecting and as relational categories, and this and that inequalities are structural. But you also um, you know, feminist principles are also that um, you're actually looking at power and power relations um, when you're looking at these different categories. And uh, ultimately, the evaluation must serve or try to build um, the capacity and, and must try to serve those marginalized groups that you're trying to evaluate with um, and that the programs are meant for. So there's a very, um, there's a different relationship there. Um, and that realizing that data or creating evidence, asking these questions, that those are very political things, that they're not, um, you might use very 
uh, standardized instruments, but ultimately creating information about, um, about uh, different social groups and, and getting them to look at it, getting others to look at it, getting society to look at it, getting program implementers to look at it. These are fairly risky acts and that they're political acts and, and that they should be taken up. Um, the other uh, key feminist principle for those of you who have worked with feminist methodologies are also familiar with is the positionality of the researcher or of who's doing the enumeration, who's doing the evaluation, who the uh, investigator is. And um, finally, this whole, and so there are many ethical questions involved in it in the way you approach particular populations and ask them very, very deeply intimate questions about their lives, whether it's experiences of violence or it's um, about their family relationships, it's about economic behavior. Um, and so there are many ethical issues involved in this. And, um, um, and at the end of the day also it's about empowering or giving voice to particular social uh, groups who through your research and so there are many, um, um, many uh, there's a lot of literature around this in the feminist um, methodology world and, it, and feminist evaluation certainly draws from this. Um, and so every time we talk about gender focused evaluation or feminist evaluation, a lot of people, uh, there's invariably a question from the audience, um, well which one is it? Is it gender focused evaluation or feminist evaluation and what's the relationship? And Donna Podems tries to um, put these together and I'm not going to read all of this, it will um, be available later. But really what she tries to say is, is exactly this distinction that gender focused evaluations try to understand what's that playing field like, what does it look like, create knowledge about particular uh, populations, ask questions about inequities, but feminist evaluation is really led by change, this desire to change, that it's a political act and it's meant to change and improve. Um, so feminist evaluation comes in and brings that set of values already to evaluation. Um, before we get into methods of design, one of the key things uh, when we're doing gender-focused evaluation is just getting clarity on our questions. You could have very descriptive questions in terms of, I've just taken an example of a CCT, but you could ask questions about who is involved in this CCT, what's the kind of population it's serving, you can do um, analyses based on women's, the backgrounds of the women who are enro enrolled, and you can also try to find out who hasn't been enrolled. And so that becomes a key question to ask, and, um, and this can be at a fairly descriptive level. Then you all can also ask very normative questions in your evaluation. So you can try to see, you know, one is you can be very much within the bounds of a project and um, ask whether the project met its own objective, um, which may be a social justice objective, it may be a coverage objective, it may be a, a expansion or reaching a particular population, or it could just be implementing a, a, a program in a particular target area. At the same time, you could also ask questions again um, based on other kinds of norms. So you could peg it against the same set of questions and the same kind of uh, information that you get. You could look at it against CEDA, you could look at it against human rights uh, provisions, you can look at it in the context of cultural norms. Um, so if you increased um, girls schooling because of your cash transfer, like. Um, was it, you know, how do you situate that change against other kinds of normative frameworks that operate within that, for that population. So there are many different ways that you can collect very, the same kind of information but look at it at different um, lenses. Then of course similarly your outcome or impact questions, you can, um, you can ask bigger questions on, you know, did it actually result in shifting social norms? So it's not just about getting, you know, 100 girls into school based on your project to because you gave them a cash transfer, but did it actually, um, a, did it actually work to change the way parents thought about girls, the value of girls' education? Did it change the way that schools responded to girls coming into the school? So you can have much broader outcome um, questions. So, so there are these, you know, so getting your question right is probably one of the first um, and the biggest, um, uh, you know, uh, step in, in designing and setting up an evaluation, whether it's gender focused or not, but certainly when it's gender focused, there are many different options that you can take, um, you can look at. You can also, you also need to be really clear about the concepts and constructs, and when it comes to empowerment, um, you know, there are several, uh, 
several different iterations of what empowerment means and how do you measure it. But one of the classic ones that, that stays with us is Naila Kabir's um, uh, framework that um, empowerment or empowering someone and it's not that anyone can empower someone else. First of all, she makes the point that empowerment is an internal process and that you really have to create and change the opportunity structures for empowerment to happen and for individuals or groups to, em to become empowered. And the way that can happen is if three kinds of or access to three elements change. One is their access to resources, another is to their um, agency and then the outcomes. Um, now, some others have built upon her work and there's been a very, very um, uh, fairly robust and large um, empowerment um, indicators um, in um, database that's been, sorry, uh, resource base that's been created by Alsop and Heinz on a few years back, so it certainly needs updating. But they came up with this degree of empowerment framework using uh, Naila Kabir's uh, framework essentially. But they, you know, I've given you an example here. So if you were looking at um, uh, political agency of women, so you would ask, do elections exist at all in that particular region, which is really about that opportunity structure, and it's at a much more macro level. Um, then do women actually try and do this, and then do they actually do it? So it's trying to look at those very uh, fine sort of uh, uh, distinctions, especially between agency and outcome, because you can, um, you know, they might be, women might actually vote, but um, if the aspiration is not created and if they may not, you know, a, small, a very small population actually votes, then there is a distinction between um, how much of an effect or how much of a change you're having um, on, on women's political agency. The other key thing is to bring, um, I'm sorry for this graphic, but a very, um, bringing an institutional approach to the way we approach gender. And what that means is, um, you know, you identify that there are these large social institutions that, that, have, that, have an, that, that have an effect on how women experience um, development outcomes, experience their own lives. And um, the key institutions st that structure this, um, this are the state, the market, the community, and the household. And the way they do it is through several formal as well as informal institutional norms. You could call them social norms. We have legal uh, prescriptions. You have cultural practices. You have some of them formalized, some of them informal. But there's a whole range of these that operate and, um, and, uh, and um, create the normative framework in which women experience mobility, women experience access to education, women experience um, um, you know, uh, uh, economic, access to economic resources, um, whether it may be in, through inheritance or getting job cards or employment. So there's a whole range of uh, institutional uh, norms that structure and mediate women's experience of these, um, of what we consider development outcomes, um, whether it's employment, health, or uh, political participation. So bringing an institutional framework like that creates a much broader and holistic picture compared to, um, you know, a very simple sort of input, output, um, um, you know, when you stay within the bounds of a program. A program may address with two or three very key elements for reasons of, um, you know, having a, a clear framework of operation, but an evaluation can bring these broader questions um, to them. Um, and finally, you've got this question of approaches. So being really thoughtful about what kind of approach you bring to an evaluation, especially um, when you're working qualitatively, is really important. And I've just uh, given you a laundry list of uh, common approaches here, some of them quantitative, some of them qualitative, and some many that we use together. There's no, they're not um, watertight uh, approaches. And, um, and so there are many ways that you can bring these together and bring together different qualitative approaches and methods um, in order to actually um, understand the effectiveness or impact or if, you know, whatever your question might be of your programs. And, um, and I just want to make a quick caveat here that, um, and I'll talk, as, as I said, I'm at heart more of a mixed methods person. And so um, what I'll say is, um, you know, this classic kind of um, almost stereotypical tension that we experience create and almost re reify between quantitative and qualitative approaches is, 
I mean it's interesting and surely um, it's quite real in the sense of you know how we believe knowledge gets created and so in terms of a very epistemological debate you can talk about you know a positivist approach giving you a certain kinds of uh, knowledge and uh, certain kinds of insights versus a more subjective um, approach and so both of them have their strengths and their limits but at the end of the day, um, of course, the, as Madhu and I were talking, the truth is not just only somewhere in between, but in all these places. So in some ways, we're trying to get as much of it as we can rather than find the most truthful. And so quantitative approaches certainly give us a wealth of understanding into gender and inequities. And I can share, I'll share a couple of examples of our own work and just talking about how we can do this well. And it tells us who, it can tell us where, and it can tell us whether something worked or not. Um, and so you could do a multiple types of uh, surveys and, you know, unfortunately a lot of times when you go to set up, eval um, not in our, I mean, especially when you work with government, um, a lot of times you go set up evaluations and because there's so much resource constraint, um, there's not a whole lot of leeway to be very experimental about methods and there's also a time constraint because we want answers quickly and we want them now and not after three years or four years that it takes to set up a very large um, design sometimes. But quantitative surveys, um, you know, when done well, um, can certainly give us a lot of interesting um, answers and give us, um, you know, the way you can, I mean, they give you the opportunity to disaggregate um, in a very, um, you know, in many, many ways. It depends on how, what approach you bring to it. Um, for example, you could do subgroup analyses of, you know, just health outcomes by, by socioeconomic or um, e economic quintile. You can also do, and in this case, when we had two rounds of data, we actually tried to compare um, or created an index of equity and looked at the equity gap. And when I said in initially what, um, when we talk about gender and equity, we're really talking about these as relational categories. So when you talk about marginalization, you want to talk about margin with regard to a mainstream. It's not the marginal um, amongst themselves. So you always want to have that kind of benchmark. And so you can create, be create, uh, creative and set up these kinds of indices. You can also see just, um, you know, who did the pro program affect most when you have two rounds of data. Again, among the marginalized, was there a difference and why? Maybe it's the ASHA worker's own caste identity that led her, when you asked her to do more visits or meet more women, that she went into more um, caste or finnal households rather than others who were also poor and who were also marginalized, but she chose to go to a particular set. So, you know, getting these kinds of insights from your quantitative data is quite possible. But of course, there are some limits. For example, it doesn't capture process or a lot of the relational dynamics. It's um, limited by who you decide to talk to right at the beginning because you set up your design a certain way. It may not help you understand always the how and the why questions. Of course, it can be costly. And sometimes um, when you do quantitative work, you forget to observe. So a lot of times you end up getting a lot of self-reported data which many people question and then um, you, um, you know, there are ways that you can triangulate or set up observation and um, um, interview kind of, uh, or survey questions that you can, or you can actually check if they have papers or if they have their certificates with them or the immunization cards. So there are ways to do that, but we don't always do it because we're trying to get through large surveys. And so our enumerators aren't always trained to do it. Um, or they can, I mean, the same bias that you, that we often face when we do qualitative work is you know, you could still ask very leading questions even in your quantitative survey. So the strength of the instrument is something that both qualitative and quantitative um, instruments will be, will need to be strong on. Now, of course, qualitative approaches do bring to light some dimensions um, that are difficult to capture by surveys alone. They, um, they ask questions about context. They help you answer why. They help you answer how. Um, at the same time, they can be time consuming, they can be expensive, they can be, they can have questions of validity um, because of the subjectivity, but there are ways to actually um, deal with that. Um, they also help us understand a lot of things that are in these, especially for empowerment, um, things that we're trying to understand about the interiority, about the changes, about perceptions, about status. I mean, there's no one single indicator that can tell you how has something affected women's status, uh, especially when you're talking about empowerment and to saying um, that empowerment is not something that's given to somebody. So if you're trying to get at decision making or you're trying to get at 
um, uh, agency, these are quite, um, these are things that take time to understand and, and get at. And um, for example, and there's also an incremental way in which our understanding deepens about these things. So, um, for, for instance, access to resources was something that after a long period of time, we actually started to ask women if they had access to, to resources. But then we realized in the last five, ten years that it's not just about access, it's about ownership and control and use. Um, there are much more important questions because women can have access because we focused on access and governments responded by giving women access to titles and you know, to land or titles to households. But then um, uh, women didn't necessarily have the right to dispose of them or to uh, mortgage them and uh, procure loans. And so but then we moved into these higher order questions. And so this is also an iterative process. And so um, there are, of course, many ways of uh, doing qualitative work. And I've just given you a very simple list again. You could do um, you know, pile sorting. You can do transect walks. You can do um, participatory appraisals. Um, this is the land that Robert Chambers developed his, um, his life's work in and so we certainly have the benefit of that and having many, many people who work with this in, in our fields. Um, you can do network analysis, so lots of qualitative um, work possible and um, ethnographic um, uh, explorations are also something that are very, very uh, possible. So there's a whole range of qualitative methods that are, that are available to us. and. Uh, um, these again, sorry, can be added anywhere into any part of an evaluation cycle or any kind of evaluation that you need to. You can incorporate gender and you can incorporate um, qualitative questions into them. Similarly, with any kind of um, design, even with a, um, whatever kind of experimental, non-experimental design, there's scope to actually build in qualitative elements. Um, for questions both of validity and, um, and reliability. And then you've got, you know, I think just some things that are very, very um, important when we talk about empowerment, which is, you know, gender and change are very context specific. So in an RCT, you control for so many, or even a quasi-experimental design, you control for a range of factors, which actually might be where the story lies of why something is different between two different populations. So, so I think trying to probe and understand that um, is, uh, is critical to empowerment. And so who, what are women's status? What is women's access to, you know, um, to resources? What is the woman's socioeconomic background? Is she a single-headed household? Is she, um, the, what's the number of children you have? So all of these things that we control for and sort of see as external um, factors uh, might be most critical. And so. Um, we, in a, so another evaluation, we actually um, tried to do this. This was a quantitative evaluation, but since we had all of this data, we ran multivariates to understand, okay, what is actually happening when we look at self-help groups and um, women? What are women's own demographic attributes? How do they help? What, um, you know, how do group characteristics help? How does it help when a health worker comes to them? So instead of you know, so in, instead of stopping with just comparing group, different kinds of groups on their particular outcomes, we actually went into unpack those groups and looked at what's happening within those groups, what are those processes looking like, and how do they actually affect how the group can be a platform for women to come together and improve health outcomes. So there's lots that's possible, and of course I mentioned Robert Chambers and the PRA, and um, here's an interesting, uh, Jagori's work is quite well known to many of us. Um, in um, the sort of gender audits, uh, safety audits that they do, um, which is a very innovative form of um, setting up um, and, and a multi-step process. So in order to be able to um, have valid information, they, they start with the situation analysis, they work with service providers, they try to get this 360 sort of uh, understanding of um, what is, uh, you know, what are the various drivers of um, safety or lack thereof. And, uh, and then they set up this checklist and have a range of people actually use it. So it's not just one person doing it, but really set up a, a selection of people who will use it and then who will bring it together and put all of their data together and see if it all looks alike or what those hotspots are. So there's a whole process that's been set up um, as an example. Then you've got another uh, in Bangladesh, a social movement, the social movement um, set up, um, sorry, um, 
supported by CEDA some time ago, where there was community-based uh, participatory monitoring, where um, you know using a number of different um, 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 you know methods to actually come up with these 132 indicators that looked at political, social, economic development. They actually started ranking their own um, you know how their groups are doing, how their uh, communities are responding to different um, interventions and. Uh, you know, and uh, they had, they fed it into a simple Excel, and they started to generate these um, different um, analyses for themselves to use. Um, so there are a lot of ways that you can do this, but of course you realize that change is both complex and contradictory, and that um, following that outlier is more interesting and important to us uh, rather than eliminating the, them from our consideration. Um, now, of course, we know that. Gen, uh, that empowerment is process heavy and so there's no, I think we've said that for many years now, but I think it's important to recognize that it's also fundamentally about power. And so you're trying to shift or disrupt power hierarchies, you're trying to work with very, very deep seated understandings and consolidations of power, both in thinking as well as in practice and in attitudes. So these are not easy things to move or change. And so when they start changing or when you start shifting or even when you just start addressing them, there's going to be a multiple kinds of responses. And one of them is, um, you know, that for example, with self-help groups, um, uh, many studies have found, and Shubh is here, so you can also talk to her later and some of their work that they did. But um, they say that, you know, gender-based violence can increase when women start to become more empowered because of the backlash. And so looking at it as, you know, if you just take gender-based violence increasing on its own without this theoretical understanding of backlash or how empowerment actually works, then we might actually uh, misjudge what's or misunderstand what's really happening. Similarly, an ICRW study found that, um, and many other studies, Nirantar did a scoping where they said families actually may get daughters married off as a way to protect and secure their safety. And so it's not that they find daughters necessarily unvaluable, but that you know the way to protect and value them may just be to get them married early. And so it might seem like a very contradictory practice for um, in a very progressive framework where we believe that marriage should be deferred. At the same time, it may be a coping strategy in the face of other worse, um, worse kinds of constraints. So really understanding context becomes critical here. Um, and then, um, you know, at the end of the day, you, if you do end up collecting all kinds of information, uh, quantitative as well as qualitative, um, sorry, how am I doing on time? I'm good. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I'd missed you. Um, but yeah, so ultimately you do want to bring different kinds of information together because um, there is value in the way different kinds of knowledge is generated. and. Um, Sometimes they function to triangulate or as a cross check for one another. When you put quantitative and qualitative information together, they can be very complementary in if, if done well, that they can bring out um, different aspects and that, you know, that the other doesn't. Um, they can also set up ways or give you this um, um, a sort of discovery of things that you know, any one method may not have. Um, may not necessarily give you. And so you discover the paradoxes or you discover certain practices and then you follow it up with a more robust method to understand and investigate. Um, they can also be very developmental in that they follow one another and improve your understanding and deepen your sense of uh, what's happening. Um, at the same time, the expansive nature of it is quite un, um, of using these methods together. Um, you can also mix methods. I mean, one of the critical things that we try to do is constantly test theories of change um, of any program. And so mixing methods is a really important or a critical way we found that it can help. For example, we have a very quantitative um, evaluation set up again of self-help groups and their effectiveness for particular programmatic interventions. But it's all based on the assumption that um, self-help group members, like if you message women in a self-help group, that they will actually speak to others. Or that they will, there's a group process that happens and then a diffusion effect happens. But then how do you actually understand that? How do you actually know who is in a woman's network? So we also um, had a partner who did a qualitative study to understand, well, who are an, uh, an SHG members networks? In, is our theory of change really valid? Is our theory of change you know, does it stand ground? Because this is a fairly strong and important assumption we are making in, in uh, working with the groups. Um, 
So there are many different ways, but I'll round off with some, um, just some principles or thoughts. One is, um, um, which I didn't uh, talk about right at the beginning because I thought it's a nice thing to come back to, which is whether it's quantitative or qualitative, your sampling is sort of the critical backbone on which your study design rests. And so, um, you know, even if we're doing focus group discussions or semi-structured interviews or structured interviews or key informant interviews, you can still sample well. You can still sample who is in your focus group discussion in the same random assign, random, you know, you can use a random sample or a PPS, whatever, you know, whatever your sampling strategy is to make the information that you get out of a qualitative uh, method robust, you do need to have the discipline of good sampling to it. And so that's one of my first key um, sort of takeaways if you want for this. Second is, um, you know, in evaluation, you're constantly in this attribution, contribution tension and that everyone wants that um, sort of, uh, ad, you know, clean, clear answer. And if your design is really clean, like an RCT, um, you can certainly get at questions of will something work and what works. But at the same time, um, if you are in a mixed methods or you are working on a program where you're simply not able to, for example, a gender-based violence intervention where you're trying to work through resource centers, it's just not possible for you to randomly assign certain centers to get the intervention and others not to. One is just the ethical questions that will come about. And secondly, you know, if, or you know, you could take a household intervention, but you know, if something is, if one group is doing something or a, how a woman is adopting something, then others will, will in the same village, will also adopt those uh, practices or will try to get the same thing. So it's really hard to kind of keep a clear or a clean control in some ways. And they, so, yeah, so it could be just the uh, practical aspects or it could be ethical considerations. So if you have those kinds of questions, try to work on a design that can help you answer your question still. And so be creative and be bold about it and realize that contribution can also give you a strong enough story um, for your program. Um, and then the question of biases. So qualitative um, uh, methods are always confronted with these question of, um, you know, they're subjective. And so I think being upfront about those, being upfront of who is doing these, who's, uh, who your enumerators are. Are they women? Are they men? Um, are they members of the community? Are they mentors? Are they uh, trainers who worked with them before? Are they program teams? Like being very um, upfront about it and confronting those is really critical and, and eliminate or control for them as much as possible. Um, and then just opening up that black box of subjectivity is important because at the end of the day, there is a power hierarchy between who's coming to ask questions and who we're trying to get this information from. And so being very clear about it and laying it all out is really important. Um, minimizing the harms of research. So some of that, I mean, I've talked about just a couple of things here. And some of it can be, I mean, we work, if you're working with violence, you're trying to get household information, you're trying to get understandings of how women spend their time, where do they go, how they, um, what uh, health uh, concerns they have. I mean, clearly, these are very difficult questions to ask in a public space, um, and they are also difficult to ask in a private space, uh, given the kinds of questions that we deal with. And so, be very conscious of the place of interview. There was a method, there was a Gita Sen's uh, done some work where they said they, they send their investigators in pairs, a man and a woman, so that the man would distract the, um, the man of the household and engage him in another conversation so that the women could have, um, you know, actually have the interview and the, the uh, investigation here. So, I mean, there are ways that you can do. You can use female enumerators when you're talking about particular um, kinds of topics, for example. Um, then I think um, being, um, it's important to look, think through and support the changes that will improve women's status. I'm, this is my last bullet. Um, and um, what, I, what I mean by that is um, being quite, um, sometimes being, you have to, if you're doing a trade, if you've got to do trade off, you've got to confront some trade offs, then, um, then, you know, maybe those should be led by, you know, certain higher order um, kinds of objectives rather than necessarily, um, you know, what's feasible. Um, and my last point is, you know, between quantitative and qualitative, there's always, I mean, that's also underpinned by this debate between, well, numbers versus meaning. 
and um, you know that's like the classic i think any number of research textbooks talk about it and um, and i think uh, only those numbers that are meaningful are important you can have any range of numbers but um, they may not actually amount to anything so being conscious both that numbers also need to tell a story and at the same time your story sometimes just also needs the support of numbers so being able to qualify quantify some of your qualitative information is also critical so i'll stop there and thanks um, and over to Madhu. Okay, so thank you very much, Yamini. So we're going to have a, a series of, of different sessions for Q&A um, throughout, throughout the afternoon. So the first will just be um, a very brief, short Q&A if there are any clarifying questions on the presentation. Um, so after each presentation, if you have any, I guess, burning clarifying questions that um, that requires some clarification, please please ask them. Um, and then after, after both the presentations, we'll have a, a longer, more uh, discussion-focused Q&A. So if anyone has any clarifying questions, please, uh, please go ahead. Hi. Uh, so I just had one question. Um, when you were talking about triangulation of data and um, we're talking about seamlessly integrating different sets of data points, with respect to your stakeholders, if you're talking to women and then you're uh, talking to, say, an Anganwadi worker and you're talking to um, somebody from the school to sort of triangulate your data. Um, for example, if you're doing an intervention for nutrition and your key stakeholder would be women, um, when you're asking them about, say, you were talking about self-reporting bias, right? So when you were talking to them and they say that, no, we feel that we're completely um, healthy, we're not anemic, we're not suffering from any sort of illness, and then you speak to the Anganwadi worker and then she tells you that there's a high level of anemia in the community. But observation-wise also you find that there's nothing, you, observation or a transect worker around the community doesn't necessarily reveal anything to you in terms of malnutrition. So at that point, your triangulation isn't exactly seamless, right? So you're getting like different sets of answers, different sets of data points. And then one more thing that you stated was to find out if you're getting complementary uh, solutions or complementary analyses from the data that you've collected. At some level, I feel, I'm, and I might be very wrong, that triangulation and aiming for triangulation or aiming for complementary um, status in a research, especially something like a situational analysis or a needs assessment, is sort of contradictory because what you're really aiming for is for triangulation. You're not necessarily getting a complementary nature there because. Um, yeah, because your, your data points don't necessarily convey that. Um, okay, so first is the easier part, which is that, um, so the triangulation and the complementarity, they don't happen automatically, nor am I saying you should look for both or either or. I mean, you can set up your quantitative and qualitative methods or your design should be in such a way that, for example, um, um, as I said, if you're not able to actually have a control group of any sort, then you can set up your, so to have a, uh, some understanding of what happened with your program from now until, you know, three years from now, you want to set up both some kind of, you know, multiple cross-sectional uh, studies perhaps, and you would also try and set up um, some qualitative like cohort studies or some kind of tracking that helps you understand for these particular groups of women or particular individuals, has your program already, you know, is it actually um, working for them? How is it working for them? What kinds of changes does it bring? What does the process of implementation and of the change look like? So that's a very, I mean, that's sort of a, because you're, you have a limitation in the way you're able to answer your evaluation question, you set it up that they're complementary to each other. Um, similarly, so, so, so the two, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're triangulating necessarily there, but you, it, it will be triangulate, triangulating what your quantitative survey will say, but in a way that will say something about your program. Otherwise, you can have, you know, multiple uh, data points about things changing um, in an environment where lots of other actors are implementing programs, lots of other changes are taking place, um, economic changes may take place. Now the question of um, what happens when you ask three different um, stakeholders and um, you don't really uh, get um, 
the kind of confirmatory answer that you want, uh, <laughs> I would say then you have to try more. You have to do more. So just asking may not get you the question. Then you actually do a you know, set up. I don't know, anemia is quite hard to, I mean, to take draw blood samples is quite difficult. So that was a very difficult uh, <laughs> kind of uh, specific question you asked. But if you're looking at education and are trying to understand learning uh, uh, achievements, for example, so you actually observe. I mean, you observe in a way that you're able to see, does this make a difference or and it may be for the anemia or um, the nutrition part you actually observe over a period of time you have them may keep a food journal and see what are they consuming I mean there may be lots of or talk to a wider range of people on agricultural patterns or food pro, uh, um, diver, dietary diversity index, index indices or uh, food availability, you know, variations by season. So you'll have to do a little more homework. Um, but yeah, so so if so if you're in such a so, and, or I mean the easy, the most reliable would probably be to do a test of um, you know. You, but then if you haven't set it up, then it can take time to understand that. So you'll have to do a, broad, a slightly bigger study to get it to resolve the contradiction because you can't leave the contradiction open. Are there any more clarifying questions? Hello. Oh, yeah. yes, in the back. Yes, yeah. Uh, my name is Devashish. Uh, I represent IDOBRO here. Uh, I'll try to uh, get back to the fundamental difference uh, between gender and feminist evaluation. In one of the slides, uh, you mentioned uh, that gender evaluation is an approach towards documenting lives of women and a feminist one is uh, more towards bringing change. So can I safely say that uh, gender-based evaluation is more of a passive and feminist is more active? Is it right to say that? So um, that was Donna Podem's trying to set up that distinction. Um, and sort of saying that actually gender-focused evaluations are more practical in that um, they are about tools, guidelines, checklists. I mean, so you have some, the UN EG has a set of, you know, protocols that are how do you integrate gender and human rights into evaluations. So they're just very different um, approaches to um, asking these questions about gender. Um, and um, so I don't think it's a passive active kind of a distinction at all. It's more about, um, I mean, and they're both, um, I mean, the thing for me is when you ask these questions about power and gender and inequality, it's already automatically political. And the way you try to address them may be through much more, um, you, know, uh, met, um, you know, you can try to influence methodology, you can try to ensure that there's mainstreaming of these kinds of gender questions into broader, wider sets of protocols. So there's just very different approaches to getting at similar answers. But a feminist, um, a feminist evaluation um, uh, approach is fairly, I mean, it's, it starts with wanting to change um, the situation of women. Now you can also uh, set up a gender focused evaluation with those very same, uh, with feminist uh, ideas. So I don't think the two are necessarily contradictory to one another. It's just that um, someone try, I mean Donna tried to se uh, set them up or set up this distinction in some ways, but there's clearly, um, there's a very common history of how these um, trajectories of these to uh, just like you have feminist research methodology and um, gender mainstreaming in a lot of disciplines in um, in um, universities, so I think it's just how it's that classic mainstreaming versus separate um, uh, uh, difference in approaches. But um, I think fundamentally they are trying to answer the same sets, similar sets of questions, but perhaps. Um, what you do with that information may be different. What you do with the learnings may be different um, if you're coming from a very explicitly political um, um, set of questions. 